journal reported that we started at 5.30. So if you came at 5.30, I appreciate that you came back. That was out of our control. It's going to stay with like us. I want to introduce Scott Wilson. He is a employee at our library. He's worked here for about five years. But he's also a huge fishing enthusiast. So he does a um, ice fishing presentation in the fall. Early winter, and then we always like to have him back to do our summer presentations. So, welcome, Scott. Can you shut the doors? Yeah, I'll do that right now. Okay, well, thank you for coming to the program and for waiting for those who came early for waiting the extra hour. Um, we're going to be going over uh, shoreline fishing because, like, some, I'm sure some of you guys don't have a boat, so pretty much my I'm exclusively a shore fisherman. Um, which, you know, sometimes it's hard, you know, some people are trying to find places like, where would you go fishing well, from the shoreline to the boat? Well, I've done, you know, I've been here since 2008, so there's a lot of places I've found that uh, you, can, you can catch a lot of fish from the shoreline with just uh, some different uh, tackle and gear that I've acquired over the last you know, five, five or six years now. Um, but uh, we're becoming specifically perch and trout, because those are the two species that are very abundant here in the hills. They're pretty much in just about every lake in the hills. Um, because of their abundance, they're also very they're also very well, they're also very sought after by most fishermen. Um, so they're written by nearly, nearly every lake. Um, there's a lot of different kinds of lures and gear and techniques available, but you know what, what how you decide what works best and uh, where are some good places to go and try. Um, that's what we're going to go over in the program. Well as, some, as well as some online resources that you can use, which I always like to promote because they're free. It doesn't cost you to use them, and uh, I'm, I'm very big on conservation. Um, so I'll also go over some tips um, as I as well. Perch is worth the perch techniques. Uh, depending on where you're fishing, perch can be an easy fish to catch or a hard fish, depending on location, time of year, uh, there's a lot of different uh, variables that go into going after perch specifically. But for the most part, like right now, uh, going after perch, you can, you can find a lot in the shallower waters, a lot in the bays. Um, so like a hook, a bobber, and a chunk of worm, you know, the very basic, the very basic uh, setup for catching perch right now. Um, doesn't require a whole lot, a whole lot of technique. Just go out there, find a nice, find a nice bay, and throw it out there and see what happens. But uh, they're not always going to be in the shallow water, especially from midsummer on. Uh, they tend to migrate a little bit deeper, where it's, where it's cooler, and there's a little more oxygen, not as much, not as much weed cover that grows into the shallow waters, close, closer to July, August, early fall. Um, so there's some deep water, some other techniques that I've used for deeper water and perch that work pretty good for the shoreline. Um, one that I use is I, I like to pitch jigs for shoreline. Um, and cast, I use 16 ounce jigs usually because they're small enough for most or for most perch or panfish and bone those to get. Um, you can also go if you're if you really if you want to eliminate a lot of the smaller stuff, you can go up to about eight ounce, but I wouldn't go too much bigger than that just because it's a little, when the hooks are getting a little bigger, um, you get perch numbers that have the biggest mouth either. You want to look for points or sandy bays. Uh, the fish, because that's kind of tends to be where, where perch will congregate, because they're going to be after the bugs and stuff coming out of the mud. Um, which most bays, generally speaking, you can, they're usually pretty either slightly rocky or a little sandy, has been my experience with most bays that I fish in. Um, these are a couple of jig, a couple types of jigs I would rec recommend. This is my probably my go-to jig for perch is this Northland Thumper jig. Um, that's what I have on here right now. It's it, when it lands, lands it kind of goes down head first, but it's got that. That blade that gives you the extra flash underwater, and when it sits in the bottom, it sits up at an angle so that your bait is facing upward, so that the person come along and just suck and just suck it up. Um, but pretty much any other standard, you know, regular lead jig is also work too. These are the ones I've had the most success with, just because I think of how the angle and the extra flash of that blade um, helps to helps to attract the perch. Uh, Slip hour techniques are another. Another one that worked pretty well for deeper water for deeper water perch. Um, you can you can get your hook down to a specific depth. This one's already rigged up with it with a with one of the, with a slip bobber. 
All you do is you get a little piece of string that uh, comes with these, and you're going to pick like a depth of, let's say you want to go nine feet deep. You're just going to pull out the line until you think you're about nine foot, and you're going to tie it, and you're just going to thread that line on and then tie it off. Like here, I've got it, this one set about nine foot deep because I used this the other day. And as soon as the bottle will sink down until it hits that stop, and then it'll just float up right. Um, it's a good way. A lot, a lot of uh, walleye fishermen also use this technique um, out, out of the farm from the shore from the shoreline as well. It's a good way to get to get a little depth control um, as well as get to those deeper those deeper water perch. Um, I'd, I'd recommend knowing the depth ahead of time just so you can kind of gauge as to where you want to set the stop at. Um, like if you're fishing a factola for instance on the dam like I was the other day, I just picked I picked nine feet because once you cast out about 20 yards you're probably in you know anywhere from 40 to 50 feet of water or better so that I was waiting for lake trout at the time, so I was hoping to find some shallower ones. But so it's a good technique to use, and rather rather cheap too, just uh, for a good way to get deeper. If you have some gear for perch, I recommend using six and a half to seven foot medium light or light action rods with uh, fluorocarbon line, just because of the invisibility of fluorocarbon it makes it really hard to, for you and the fish to see the line underwater. But this one, for instance, is a seven foot a seven foot light rod. It's got a lot of backbone in here, but it's got a nice uh, loose tip. So when I'm throwing the jig out, I can, I can, feel, I can feel the bites, I can feel all the rocks. But I'm getting all the nice going out. <clears throat> For slip bobbers, I like to use six to six and a half foot medium light or medium action rods. And no, you can use floor carbon, you can just put mono on those, just they're not you know, too specific about that one. Like this one here, the six foot medium rod, has got a six pound test. Or just rid of monofilament on What's the difference between your fluorocarbon line? And well, fluorocarbon is, is a little, it's, it's invisible in the water. Like you, can, you can still see mono when it's underwater, but it's at a thinner diameter and light passes through it instead of reflecting off it like it was mono. So you can see it's a lot harder to see in the water. For really clear water, especially when you, if, you're going, if you're going shallow water, like for trout or for perch in shallow water, fluorocarbon is really nice because you can't see, you can't see the line and neither can. Some lake, the lake, if the lakes are staying clear, you can use you know, and this works pretty well. Um, Optima is also pretty cheap. Um, you can buy like 300 yards for five or six dollars. Uh, fluorocarbon is a little bit more, a little bit more, but the line lasts a little bit longer. It doesn't coil as bad and not strike a lot stronger than it is with monofilament. There's also not as much stretch on, on fluorocarbon, which gives you a little more of a, a, good, of a good hook set instead of that stretch that mono has. I use some different uh, rod brands, and some line, uh, different line brands I use. Um, that work really well. I usually use Berkley uh, line a lot just because I think it's, really, it's a really good line. But uh, Muffin also makes some good, some good monofilament line too. Going well, for trout. Uh, generally speaking, trout are very curious by nature. If you throw something out there and they're around, they will usually at least follow it, even though you won't be able to, you may be able to see them, but generally speaking, they will. Interested in what you're throwing out. Spinners and spoons uh, are the best kinds to use, but there are so many different types out there um, that it's kind of hard to figure out which ones might work. Uh, still fishing is also a way to do it, or dead sticking, as I call it, with just bubble bobbers, which are just clear bobbers filled with a little bit of water. And you can throw out dough baits and things like that. That's simple to use. At Sylvan, dough baits are pretty popular, as well as at uh, Royal Bay Lake. A lot of guys use just those little, just that, just that little dough bait you can buy in the stores. Um, the classic, classic go-to spoon for trout is the Castmaster. Uh, it's eight ounce in gold is my favorite color to use. It's one I have the most success with. Um, but uh, they're all, they're, there are a few different colors out there. This is a, these are a couple right here. So here's a gold one, and here's a silver one. Let's pass those around. This is the size I like. To, I want to go much smaller, much smaller for trout, just because. You gotta be able to cast out a little bit little ways too when you're going when you're, when you're fishing for trout. So the eighth ounce is a really good size and a very commonly used uh, lure in this area. And they're rather expensive, about two and a half dollars per 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 lure. Map spinners, and rooster tail spinners are also very common. I don't use the rooster tails very much. They I use them a lot for more for like the streams and creeks because they're a little lighter. Um, they're not quite as big as the MEPS uh, spinners are. Gold and rainbow colored blades work the best. I like to have the ones that have a little bucktail on them. This is 
gives a little more, a little more action under the water. Um, I like the, the rainbow blades always seem to work the best, especially on, on, on a nice sunny day. And that's just a couple of examples. This is like this is like that same color, like you have the gold with the uh, rainbow colored blade and a nice buck with bucktail action on it. And a tried and, no, tried and true one is a little Jake's in the eighth ounce as well. Um, you probably see, probably seen a lot of guys using these, a lot of these easy ones around here. They're working really well at Pactola right now. Um, it's just a U-shaped spoon that doesn't, has a lot of action under the water. And gold with the red dots is probably, in my opinion, probably the best color. If you're gonna get, you're gonna get one, that's the color you get is the gold with the red dots. And they're also rather expensive as well. If we're, if we're for a nice easy way to get in the glamour trout. But, but probably my best and favorite spoon to use is what I call a secret. It's what I call a secret one because I no one really uses it because it's it's considered more of a uh, a jigging uh, spoon than it is an actual casting spoon. The Northland Buckshot Rattle Spoon, and a quarter ounce to a big <coughs> to an eighth or three eighths ounce in gold is probably the best spoon that I use right I use overall when it comes to casting for trout from shore. And that's the that's the color action there. This was one I caught a couple weeks ago. This big 16 incher. Uh, from, shore, from the shoreline in that uh, Pactola. But all it is is it's just a, just a, it's like a flat spoon, but it's got that early uh, rattle chamber in the back. So when it's going through the water, you can hear a different, uh, it, makes a, it makes a noise in the water. Um, like I said, that's probably, uh, I found out about that one right in Cabela's about, about six, seven years ago. Some guys were using it at Canyon Lake. That was using the rattle chamber out of it. Uh, and they, what they told me what they were using and how they were catching them. And my first thought was, well, how would you use a jigging spoon for catching a trout like that? Especially in that, in that side. I mean, that's a pretty heavy weight. Um, but I used, I, I bought a gold one and went out and used, used a couple days later. Got a bunch of them. So I've been using a lot ever since. And like the probably that's my favorite one to use. Nothing else works. Or if I can uh, just go and try anything, that's the, that's the one I would, I would recommend above most other ones. A little more expensive than the others, but uh, well worth it. The different gear to use with trout. I like to use five to six foot ultralight rods, uh, just because you can you can really whip a, good, whip a spoon out there good ways when you got that you with that with the action that they provide. Especially for a little, it, it helps the castle to throw with the lighter ones as well. Um, you want to look for a rod that loads well. You don't want a, a, I call them a noodly rod. Take the rod and you just do this, and the whole rod just kind of flops. That's uh, not, there's not, there's not a lot of a load in it. You want to be able to, when a fish hits, you want to be able to get a good set. Um, like the one I usually use, I got a five and a half foot ultra right here, but it's got good action in the tip, but you notice it does, the rest of the rod doesn't really bend a lot. So I got a good, I get a good, uh, good, I get a good, we're going to load the rod this part here, so I'm setting the hook. I get a good hook set with this one. And ultralights are just really fun to catch trout with because you know even a small trout will still give you a good fight. And with an ultralights, it's really a lot of fun to catch, especially when you catch them bigger than you catch above 15 or 16 inch or bigger. It's a good, it's a fun fight watching that rod bend. Uh, real size when it comes to trout or for or for the perch fish for that matter, uh, you only have to go about 500 size, which is pretty much what most of these ones here are. They're just smaller 500 sizes. But you just cast it from shore. You're not throwing on you know, eight feet of water and bringing it back. That's all you really need. Uh, with either monofilament, four pound test is what I, what I usually recommend. But if you are, if you think you might catch something a little bigger, like if you're fishing like at uh, Sheridan and Astora, or you might catch a northern as well, you can probably go up to this. I would go higher than that. So it's, it's just a little easier to cast small, these, all these small lures with the four pound test. What does the 500 mean? Oh, it's just, a, well, most reels, they go by a 500, 1500, 2500, or 3500 size. And as the number gets bigger, so is the reel. Like this one here, this is just a, just a 500 size uh, Cabela's fish eagle. Um, whereas this one here is a 1500. So you can kind of see the difference in the reel size. Once you get into the bigger, when, when, you, get, when you get into the 2500 and the 3500 size, you're really, I mean, you're, you can hold you know, three, four, three hundred yards or more, eight pound tests on most of those ones. Does the, the number 
equate to the diameter of the spool? Or that's a good question. Um, I just that's that's just way to model, that's the way. There's and Shimano, Cabela's, and uh, Shields brands all have the all go with that same number sequence, but there are a few others that use a different. So I'm not sure if it's just a if it's actual actual the size of the, the circumference of the reel or if it's just their way of numbering it. Um, that's it. Okay, some different places to go around here. Uh, Pactola, for instance, is one I've been a lot with it's because the rainbow bite's been pretty hot. Um, there's also a lot of perch and multi other, a lot of other species there. The North Marina and the Veterans Point area has a lot of access points, a lot of bays, a lot of trails, and a good chance to catch both species. The south side, as well, has got the boat docks. Uh, there's some different coves and points. If you just kind of drive past the South Marina there along that path by the beach, You'll see a lot of different little areas you can pull off, and there's points and bays that you can hit. And for the most part, you can go over there and have a good chance of catching at least, at least trout if you're using spoons. I think it's like to use here slip bobbers with orange chartreuse jigs uh, for perch. And the buck, then the, the buckshot trout spoon or the little jigs um, right now are working, working really well for the trout, especially, especially in the uh, Veterans Point in the North Marine area. Uh, so here's, like, here's the veteran, here's Veterans Point, there's a trail that comes down here. Uh, this is the area I've been fishing a lot lately, I've been catching a lot of, a lot of trout. Um, I've tried fishing on the dam here the last couple times too for some for shallower lake trout, but I've been catching a lot of rainbows too on these, on these same spoons. And then down here on the south side you've got the docks where you can catch a lot of perch. There's a lot of coves and bays here where you throw a slip bobber, you get a good chance of catching some good uh, perch. This, and the veteran bay here has also got a lot of perch if you're not fishing off this uh, close off this point, which I usually do. And then off of the North Boat Marina here, these points here are good places for perch as well. Sheridan is another lake that I like to go to a lot here, uh, towards, more towards uh, like June. Uh, the shoreline along Highway 385 has got those docks on both sides of the area there. On um, the west side, I usually tend to catch more perch. Kind of especially in the, cact in the cactail area that's just a little further past the docks. On the east side, uh, more trout. I think mean, it's because there's a little different uh, orientation as far as the weeds and the mud in the area. There's a little more mud on the west side than there is on the east side. And trout, like, like they have a little lot, like trout have more cover than perch do. Especially with the mud where they can be snatching up their fish and bait. South Marina Campground, there's a lot of different bays and points, especially right off of the boat, dock, the boat launch area there. Um, I've caught a lot of perch in that area. You catch a few rainbows uh, here and there as well. Uh, Dakota Point right now has been a pretty good place to catch trout and uh, crappie. In the last fishing reports I've seen in the journal. Um, techniques to use there for perch. Thumper jigs work best. Um, you can catch a few on slip bobbers too, but uh, I seem to catch a lot of fish, especially on this particular color. Um, at Sheridan's, this uh, orange and chartreuse color. Seems to work really well. Tip with either a tip with half a crawler or a minnow on, minnow on occasion too. Beginning begin of summer is a good time for minnows and then towards the middle of the summer as we use fish worms. And then the next spinners and buckshot spoons work pretty well for trout, especially on the uh, what east, on the east side of three to five there. Here's your here's your just the three to five bay area. Um, these are your docks are in this area where the parking lot's at. If you don't mind, walk up a little bit further into this cactail area up here. It's a good place to catch. It's a good place to, to pitch a jig out for uh, perch and uh, crappies. And then you got those docks on the other side here. That's where you catch more of the more of your rainbows. Um, you get just out there here. This area, this bay here is really there's a, there's a really high concentration of perch and crappies in this area. Um, this point here as well, and this back in this bay. But you're fishing more in the deeper water, that's usually where the trout are going to be hanging out too. But because it could, could, if you're fishing, pitch a jig out here, a lot of times those perch would hang out because of how deep it gets in a hurry. If, if you find a steep ledge like that on a lake map like this, generally that's where you can find uh, perch, because just like walleyes, so if you find a good point where it gets deep fast, it's a good place to get something on the bottom uh, for the perch. Deerfield's another, another popular place. Um, I go over a lot in the winter in the during, during ice season, but uh, it's also there's a lot of areas to go there for Pokemon as well. It is loaded with trout, display, and perch. A lot. Um, a lot of ways and points. 
The shallow water, anything under 10 feet deep, is teeming with rock bass. It's a good place to take kids to because you're pretty much guaranteed to catch, that they're going to be happy by catching a lot of fish. And they're not going to be the biggest fish, but uh, they will keep them entertained for a while. Um, I found out a lot. I was fishing this year. If I got any shallow than 10 feet, I caught nothing but rock bass. So there's plenty of action there in those for kids who just want to go out and catch something. But if you go a little bit deeper, you want to just slip over, get it out a little ways, and like uh, like Pactola does get a little deep in a hurry there, if you're out for fishing off a point. Um, or for trout, the cast master and the best things work, uh, work well there, especially especially that cast master. Got a lot, got a bunch, a lot of splaking rainbows with that at that gear field. Different areas to go. There's a boat launch area here. I fished off these two points here, caught, plenty, caught lots of lots of trout, played back in these bays a little bit more for a little more perch action. Uh, you can throw you can throw a slip bobber out in this area here, catch a lot of, a lot of different sizes of perch and rock bass if you don't cast out uh, too deep. And then gold run here um, also is a big on, especially a lot of a lot of perch in, this, in the bay here. And if you go a little deeper into the third, if you cast out a little deeper into the middle of it. A lot of different access points. I haven't fished up in, up in here yet, but I will get up one time and there's some kind of trout with different colors and bays here. And plus, they did release those lake trout, if you guys haven't heard, they did release 55 um, <coughs> big lake trout into, back into Deerfield to help kind of try to see how well they're going to do and then see if they can help control the rock bass population a little bit. But they were at least 27 inches a bit long when they were released, so there are at least that many big fish or big lakers in your field right now. Some other places to go are Robay and Sylvan. Uh, Sylvan's one of my favorite places to go to because it's just it's a very scenic lake. <coughs> those, are, those are just for trout. <coughs> Season, a lot of guys were, were talking that uh, they were a lot of them were worm free, but then towards the end of the winter, I started hearing about guys catching more of them with worms. So, um, you know, I would say if you want to keep any, if you want to keep anything out of any, any perch out of stockade, uh, you might want to, I would say, def, I would say uh, keep a few of them cut and just kind of cut them open and check. Otherwise, it's pretty hard to tell. So, I mean, most other places you don't have to worry about worms, but stockade is <laughs> I haven't heard anything recently as far as if well, guys are catching them when they've had worms or not since the ice came off. <coughs> but we'll flip that on That's usually we should be hearing about that probably sometime soon. Uh, so local fishing resources. Uh, the journal has their weekly fishing report. If you saw on the side, uh, it's, always, it's usually always on the right side of the page there with the fishing reports from different lakes. Um, they get a lot of their information from the rooster or from some different websites. Um, I, I post pretty regularly to a couple of fishing, local fishing uh, blog or forums that uh, get a lot of information as far as what's biting on what, where. Um, and just going down top of those guys at the, the rooster is good. It's good if you're, before you're going out, it's a good way to get some information as to where, you know, what's biting on what and where. Um, so don't be afraid to use them for a resource. One of my favorite ones to use is the Game Fish website because they have free contour maps um, that you can down, download and print off from your own computer or from your computer shared library from a printer, and it's free. And they're not, you know, they're not the highest detailed maps, like if you were to buy those little chips for like boats that you use for the sonars, but you know, for fish for sure, you really don't need to have a lot of high detail. Um, but all those maps you saw beforehand, those were all, those were all from the Game Fish website. If you were to say go, go to that one, for instance. There's a permit statewide. You can go into Richard County. 
So you can go to all the different lakes <laughs> across the state, wherever you were through going some place to go fishing. Um, and they pretty much, just about every, every lake, even, even little lakes, still have a, have a lake map on it. But it's a good, it's a good, it's a good resource to use if you don't want to spend hundred dollars on a chip to get some, to get to get newer lake maps. Online resources. Excuse me. Yes. Um, have you fished Iron Creek at all? I have not been to Iron Creek yet, um, um, but I hear I hear that there's a good trout and crappie population out there. Um, some friends of mine live in spearfish and say I should come try that here. So hopefully that's one, that's one of the lakes I want to get to. So I'm hopefully try it out. It's a little more of a trip, yeah. kind of out there a ways, but uh, maybe it'd be, it'd be fun to try to try to try the lake out. So if I was going there, I'd, be, I'd probably go there with uh, two rods, one one, one ultralight for trout, and another probably bring a probably bring a split, uh, split bar set up. Because if there's crappie out there, those will bite out, those will bite as well on that setup. Uh, one of the sites I use them for posting my fishing reports is, is, is sdoinsider.com. Um, a lot of it's, uh, it's used by a few by some people here and there. You don't see a whole lot of reports on there yet because I don't think some people still aren't, aren't really posting a lot of their reports online yet in the state. But uh, I, I really like to go to, I post the, I post the next day within a couple days how the, how the fishing was. Um, and I see what some guys will post from like a lot of farming or from the river if you want to go to the river to fish for. Walleyes or a lot of guys are posting from the river. Um, Hotspotoutdoors.com uh, is a great place for tips. Uh, guys will be talking about uh, you know what kind of what kind of line should I use for this species or you know does this jig work or if you did have a boat do they talk we'll talk about you know different sonar setups and, and uh, it's a good it's a good place to get some information on different not necessarily on your fishing reports but you'll get a lot of information on fishing related stuff. And Hooks and Media Outdoors, or there was each of the other was each of some outdoors, is a uh, online resource that I like to use. A great site for tips. And they've got ways to contact a lot of their uh, their fishing, their staff there. And you can ask ask them questions. Um, you can watch videos that they post of people have been trying different techniques, different species of fish, including including perch and uh, not so much rainbows, but you know, it's more of a, more of a hill specific thing. But there are there's a lot of videos out there on perch. Right? Small enough body on bass. Um, and there are also lake maps on there. If you were to, if you were to access that site, <coughs> but you've got, uh, you've got the blog here where you can post different questions. You can contact their different, their different staff. Uh, post, they post a lot of photos, post a lot of videos, um, and there's different ways to contact them if you, do, if you want to ask kind of a general question. <clears throat> but it's a good, it's a good site to use, it's a good resource to use if you're looking for information about any, any, any kind of fishing, not just rain, not just trout or perch. But uh, it's, a good, it's a good site to use to find out some fishing information. Uh, as far as part of my conservation is I, brought, I practice selective harvest. Um, if you catch the big one. It's, uh, you know, do you keep it or do you release it? Well, it's really up to you. Uh, nobody's going to tell you to, if you want to keep that fish, that big fish and have it mounted, you, know, you go right ahead. That's, def that's, your, that's definitely your choice. Um, a lot of conservation groups, a lot of locals, like to release those big fish in the back of the water because those are the ones that, you know, they got, they got, they got to that point because they, they, have, they had the strongest genes, they had the strongest habits that kept them alive that long to get as big as they were. So we like to try and pass that down to the next, you know, the next generation of fish, just to keep the population strong and to you know, keep the, weak, the weaker ones getting even the strongest ones will survive. Those are the ones we like to keep in the water. Um, take some pictures if you want. I mean, a lot of guys, if you want to, a lot of guys who catch lake, big lake trout out at the uh, Pactola, they'll take photos, take they'll take measurements, and then they'll release the fish because it takes decades for those fish to get as big as they are. You know, a 20 pound laker might take 15, 20 years to get that big. Um, so, and, and a lot of taxidermists can actually make an exact amount with the weight of the measurements you took in the pictures. Um, it's important to preserve fishing for future generations like practice like a harvest, um, to keep the population strong, abundant, as well as, you know, make sure you clean up after yourself when you're on the shorelines too. I, 
I don't, I, I don't like walking on the shoreline to find beer cans and um, anything else. I usually pick a lot, try to put a lot of stuff up so the shoreline's clean. Um, there's a, a good organization called Recycled Fish. They're a nonprofit organization that uh, they, got, they got a lot of tips and things you can do and just a kind of a self pledge you can take. You know, that I will, I pledge to clean up, you know, the, 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 uh, the shoreline. You know, I pledge to pick up one piece of garbage when I go out. You know, just something simple like that can really go a long way to protecting, the, protecting our waters for the future. In conclusion, um, there's a lot of different types of gear out there and for, for the, these, two, these two species, but a lot of times simple try on gear can help you find the, like, your lucky lures, as I like to call them. That's why these ones here I showed you are kind of my go-to ones, especially like the buckshot screw. Um, whether jigging, slip bobber, and casting spoons, or spinners, do some homework, you know, check out the lake maps. Generally speaking, if you look for points in bays, there's a good chance you can go out and catch either perch, trout, or wolf. Um, have fun, get the kids involved, um, because if they're, not, if they're not getting involved, then you know, the future of sport doesn't, uh, doesn't go very far unless the next, unless the next generation is also trying to get into fishing as well. So it's more as important to take them out, take them out and get them involved. And if you have any questions after after this, besides one you can ask here in a little bit, um, you can contact me. It's my email address, drauger81 at hotmail.com. Yeah, when you're fishing from shore, uh, how do you deal with the moss? And that's cool well, around it. <coughs> yeah, if, or uh, somewhere else. if you're, yeah, you either move someplace else or you switch your technique. If I'm fishing for perch and all I'm catching is moss, I'll switch to a I'll switch to a slip bobber setup. Because then, I, cause then you, cause usually I usually always look at the map, the, my maps before I go out. You know, okay, so I'm going to be here. I kind of know the depth is going to be about this. And then uh, when I get out there, if I'm fishing a lot of moss, I just adjust that string on my on the, on the slip hour setup. And I'll just throw that out there. You can, you can jig with a slip hour setup. But you're just keeping it off the bottom off of that moss. You just you know, give it a rub and jerk and little, your line will come up through the bobber and it'll set down. And it's, a good, it's a good way to jig with a cock. Or is I saw the website up. It's kind of a little long on the website, but uh, it's got more information that I like to post. Um, I got photos, product information, um, my contact information is also on there. It's dragerauger81.wix.com slash dragerauger81. Um, but you can always get a hold of me through that or through my email. If you have any questions, you want to know, you know about what the recent reports are I've heard, what lures are working, where should you go. If you got kids, you want, if you want to keep kids entertained, um, you know, there's different places, you know. So don't be afraid to just drop me, drop me an email, visit the website, and uh, I'll help you out as best I can. And that's it. So, any more questions? Do you have rivers or streams? Yeah. Pretty much just here in the hills. Um, I do go up north uh, to land every once in a while in the summertime, and I'll fish the Grand River, uh, usually for walleyes, but usually I'll be throwing out jigs or uh, if they're running a little further down from the spillway areas, I'll be throwing out like crankbaits or pollens um, for that. But I don't get over to the, to the Missouri uh, very often. No. Like uh, I went up there uh, beginning of this beginning of uh, May and April. Um, I heard the walleye bite was pretty good, and I was it was uh, pretty much just pitching jigs up there. Um, we did catch uh, a friend and I. We did catch a few up in the channel area as well as over by the dam. Um, but in that area, you will, if you're owned by the dam, which is, kind of, which is where the reports are this week, they said that there's a lot of activity now going over the dam. Uh, bring a bunch of jigs because you're going to lose a lot because it's very rocky. Um, but if they are there, it, you should be able to come out with, with some. And the last one we caught there was on the dam was uh, 19 inches. Uh, I think the spawns already happened, so they won't be quite as aggressive. But uh, the reports are saying they're going to pick back up here as we get as the water moves a little more. We have to get out there and try for them. How about spearfish camp? A lot of guys go for fly fishing, but uh, I haven't tried. I haven't uh, gone out there yet to try uh, and throw on a working tail or a smaller lure like that in the creeks. So yes? If you're fishing for trout, you're using the Northland buckshot rattles. How rapidly do you retrieve? Well, if you're using if you're using that that, that, like, if it's that size, using that three eighths ounce, you're going to be reeling it back at a decent. I mean, the target. I mean, you're pretty much you're going to reel like this I mean, for the most part. It's a it's a pretty good clip because it's a heavy weight. If you reel if you reel slowly, it will sink pretty quick. 
So you're going to be going to a decent clip. But the nice thing about when, how fast you're reeling is, when a bird, when a trout wants to hit it, you're going to know. He's going to, he's going to hit it hard. Um, it pretty much goes with about any spoon, even the lighter ones like the uh, like the little jakes. A little bit, little bit lighter lure doesn't fall quite as fast. But you're still going to be reeling up a good clip because you want that action because that's what that's what induces the fish to, to the trout to hit. Um, um, with, if I'm jigging, sometimes I do, and sometimes I don't. Um, like right now, I've got just a little swivel on there, so I can switch my baits quick. Um, when I was when we were fishing up at uh, Orman, I, I just I just tied directly to the line. Um, it's kind of up to you if you want me if you want to tie it, if you want to swivel or tie it directly to the line. I don't think there's a whole lot of difference. Um, I think if you swivel if you swivel on, it gives a little bit more action. You can rock back and forth a little bit easier. Um, on the swivel, they can't be tied directly to the line. If they're fishing in the rocks, for instance, it doesn't really matter if tied to the line. I think with uh, when I'm fishing for, when I'm going for perch, for instance, I like the swivel because it lets the lure sit with the head in the mud and, that, and the hook end, hook end stands out like that. So you can pivot and swivel on that and swivel on. Any advice on setting the hook? Well, if uh, pretty much if, 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 if you're catching a, if a rainbow's going to hit it, uh, you don't have to set the hook because it's going to set itself from how hard it hits. I mean, you, you'll know when a, when, a, when a trout hits your line. It's going to be a good a hard hit, or going to just be a good, good, good snap. Um, if you're jig, if uh, you're jigging, especially if you're depending on the size of the rod you're using. If I'm using my big one, Joe Seven Footer, um, it doesn't take much. It's just a kind of a, either a slow lift if it's something biting, or just occasionally just a little pop. Is all it really needs to set the hook. But it's not like you know when you're if you're if you are either if you're vertical jigging, if something bites when you're vertical jigging, you tend to kind of pull weight up. But uh, the trout pretty much is on itself, and you don't have to do a whole lot on, uh, if, you're, if you're pitching the jig up because you all you do is a little quick little snap and you've got it. Any other questions? Uh, I haven't done it in a few years. I did it when I, when I first went working at Cabela's. I started, I started doing a little bit here and there, but uh, I caught a catch a few trout and uh, some rock bass back up a year ago. But uh, otherwise, not pretty much just. Uh, I do if I go if I go to the creek here, I usually just bring out my Troy rod, a couple of rooster tails, and uh, just throw it. Just kind of look for little pockets in the cone and things like that to try and catch trout in. But for the most part, I'm just doing most of the lakes and the reservoirs here. You have dead lakes here with no. Um, well, right now, we had three lakes that were drained before the winter. Um, Horse Thief, Lakota, and Bismarck were drained. Um, they've, all been refilled, they've all been refilled now, um, and Horse Thief has been restocked with trout, I believe. But I haven't heard anything about the other two lakes yet. Uh, Bismarck is a little further, if you're not familiar, is a little bit further south uh, by Custer. And Lakota's out there, kind of in the hills by Center Lake. I haven't heard about them being restocked yet, so I consider those two dead lakes right now. Um, but otherwise, uh, pretty much any way you can go around here, you can usually find at least some trout. The game and fish really likes to keep the lakes stocked with trout around here. Have they already stocked this spring? The yeah, horse thief, yeah. yeah. South Dakota State. Yes, yes. Stocked. Yeah. Uh, it's, one, it's one reason why the bite's been pretty hot at Pactola, because they just, they just stocked Pactola recently. So there's a lot of 11 to 15 inch uh, trout in there right now. Well, if uh, if you're casting, you're not going you're, you're going to be keeping it probably within about this far of the surface. You're, you're not going to be letting it sit, letting it sink because um, you're going for trout. Trout tend to be mid mid to double water feeders. Uh, if you're going for, if you're going for perch, if you're jigging, you got to eat some all the way to the bottom because because that's where it's where you're going to find the perch at. If you're slip bobbering, that's where you want to kind of your homework a little bit so as far as the depth. Um, usually, if I'm fishing out, if I'm usually out at Sheridan, I mean, I'm going with the uh, bar setup, I'm about six feet down. And I set, I set, I set my little string to about six feet, and I just throw it out. I'm usually, I'm usually anywhere from about six to twelve feet deep, and so I'm covering kind of that middle area. Because um, perch are perch are upward feeders for the most part, they, unless they're unless they're sitting around the ground looking for your jig. But most part, there's a little, there's a little action above them, they'll notice it and they'll feed up. 
just like just like profit. If you didn't have the luxury of having five or six rods, you were going to try and do fishing for trout and perch. What would be what's if I had just one rod? Around? If I had one rod to pick for everything, I would go with a medium light. It's probably a six and a half foot medium light. Um, I think it's kind of the best in between as far as you know. The uh, you know the fighting you know the castability with lighter lures, but also has a little more strength to deal with uh, you know, snags, bigger fish. Um, you can catch. I mean, I've caught northern on all choice before, and I've been afraid the rods are going to break. But uh, you know it's, it's it is possible. But I was picking just an everyday rod, just one rod, medium light, six and a half foot. That will take care of about about ninety percent of your species. In a couple of instances, you recommended. Half a worm. Mm -hmm. Not all worms are the same size. Yep. Uh, how long should that worm be? <laughs> well, if I'm using if I'm using <laughs> trout worms, you know, there there and there's trout worms that I've, you know that they sell here, and then there's night crawlers. Uh, if I'm if I'm going specific for perch or trout, I'm usually using the trout worms. The trout worms only about that big. You can go that long. You can thread them all. You can thread it all into a hook, and no problem. If I'm using if I'm using uh, night crawlers. Um, I'm usually, I'll take it, I usually go big crawler and I'll kind of find the middle point, break it in half, and then I'll put the other half on, one of the halves on the hook. Um, so you're looking at a problem, you know, your average trout worm is probably about that big. Your average crawler half is about that big. That's you know, about, three, about three or four inches. But you don't want to, but if, the, if you're, losing, if you're losing, losing your tail end a lot when you're jig fishing or if you're uh, slip bobbering, shorten up a little bit even more because they're just, the fish are just biting at that tail. The tail's just doing this off the, <coughs> off the hook. So if you short it up just a little bit, you get a better chance of hooking up the dead and sucking the hook as well on the size of the tail end. Also, a, uh, another good, another good uh, all around fish catcher is your standard crappie rig, which, you know, which are about a dollar and a half to two dollars. Uh, these work really well with, if this time of year because I usually prefer minnows to worms on these because you get the action, but uh, this is a Good all around. You know, throw this out in the bottom with a, with a little bobber about here, a little weight in the bottom. This will catch about any, about, about every species of fish in the hills right now. A lot of guys were using these for walleyes up at the at the Ormond recently too, off, off of Gaines Point. But that was a couple weeks ago, and I don't hear anything about them since right now. So, but this was a good one to use when you're not in a rocky area or a weedy area because it'll snag everything if you're not fishing in a bay or just like a shallow or a gravel or a gravelly bay area. Is that about the size hook you use? For yeah, this, this, this size hook this is, a, uh, is, a, is a size 2. They come in 2, 4, and 6. Um, and the 6s are pretty small. I'm always afraid of, I, I hate deep, hook, deep hooking fish because then you usually end up killing them. So I usually go with a little bit bigger so that with these longer shafts because then they usually at least they'll only catch about that much and get it out a little easier. You get some little fish off. Yeah. It keeps, it, keeps, it keeps your smaller fish off. Yeah. Fish off. yeah if you have to go with a little bit bigger. Let's go with a size 2 hook. Size six hooks are they're smaller and like you know I used to used to used to, used to you throw a lot of fish with those smaller hooks so I kind of got on the bigger ones to avoid just trying to avoid that problem. A couple more little accessories when it comes to doing, doing especially if you're if you're jigging, bobber fishing or um, slip bobbering, always have a pair of forceps with you um, just to just to make sure you get those out of these areas. A lot of times you can avoid. Even if you deep throw a fish, if you have a good pair of forceps, you can usually get in there and just push it back a little ways and twist it out. And you can still you can let the fish go and you want, you want if you want to hurry. Otherwise, there's these, there's these little, uh, these are called T2 toothpicks. Uh, a little company called Cold Snap Outdoors out of Sioux Falls makes them. The rooster sells them. They're like two and a half bucks. So I always carry one of these in my pocket because, because it allows you to get in, the, get in the mouth, push that hook back, and lift it up and it pops right out of the mouth. So you get a lot less, a lot less fish more. A lot better fish mortality. Um, if you use it's another, toothpick, right? it's, yeah, it's called a T2 toothpick. Yeah. The rooster's one place in town that sells it right now. What's the difference between that and the, I think they call it the chopstick? Is it just it's an yeah, it's I mean, there, there's, a different, there's a couple different there's couple different companies out there out there that make these. Okay. Um, so it's just, same just, it's just the same principle. Yeah, these are just the ones that uh, I like to use. Um, you hook you hook them right to your vest with a little little like over. And they're very mixed and they're, and they're very expensive. So, 
that's it. Um, you guys can come up and check out the gear if you want. Um, <laughs> I do keep one ice rod for dock fishing, okay. especially on a pack call right now. You go out there, you can just look at the other packs, you go out there, just fish on the docks. I do still get more ice fishing here in the summertime. Yes. No walks. Or crappie, if I do have yeah, you still use those tails if you want to get yeah, the rooster, bell shields. Most of the gear, most of the gear I did all